but uh, a special word of welcome to our guest speaker today or guest lecturer, and that's Dr. Gletwin Rubich. Before he starts, I'm just going to very briefly uh, tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's currently a senior lecturer at Nelson Mandela University. Uh, but before that, he was schooled at Union High in Net, and he then studied analytical chemistry and worked at the then old PE Technicon. Um, and he's been there since 1991. He's obviously got a doctorate degree, uh, which he completed in 2003, and his research interests are analytical chemistry, environmental chemistry and analysis, and science engagement. Um, Gletwin has supported us a lot in the past, and I think he still does in the Eastern Cape with running uh, fun science and chemistry workshops at schools and during some of our uh, science fairs. Now, his main sort of interest in terms of, uh, you know, sort of his personal things is free diving and underwater fishing. And he's been free diving since 1990, and he's got Protea colors for underwater fishing in 2008 and free diving in 2009. And he holds four national records in fishing and 10 national records in free diving. And what I haven't told you, he's, he's 52 years old and married with three children. So that's quite an achievement to hold all of these records. And part of what he's going to be telling us today is about one of the competitions, uh, international world championships, which he's just been taking part in, in Egypt uh, recently. But I'm not going to spoil his thunder. Dr. Rubich, over to you. And thanks again. All right, let me just get my video going so you guys can see who's talking. Right, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, whoever's present. Right, so I'm going to start off my uh, presentation. I'm just going to upload the, the PowerPoint and I'll work through that bit by bit. Uh, so it'll all be based around the PowerPoint. I might play one uh, external video. So let me just do this screen sharing quickly. Okay, right, fantastic. Right, so the title of my presentation today then is The Gas Laws and the Mammalian Dive Reflex, a Freediver's Perspective. So um, the first time I encountered these gas laws was when I did uh, analytical chemistry and one of our stud subjects was physical chemistry and we were actually had to learn about the gas laws, how gases change volume, et cetera, volume and pressure and temperature. So we covered that in PhysChem and uh, I get to revisit it in a very practical point of view here. And I want to share some of my experiences over the years that I've learned and I'm still learning, I'm always, always learning. I wanted to share some experiences on application of the gas laws and then also on a topic called the mammalian dive reflex, which is a very interesting subject, uh, especially for us who do free diving, but also for mammals that do free diving, such as seals or whales or sometimes birds. All right, so you go to the next slide. So just what I'm going to discuss, Ooh, I've got a red line somewhere through my spectrum here. All right, so... Uh, uh, presentation outline. I'm going to just go through a disclaimer because I wouldn't want anybody trying any experiment that might harm themselves. Uh, the same as chemistry, if I were to give you a bit of the, a little bit of learning can be dangerous. I just need to make sure that your learning is, you know what the risks are before you try something. Right, so then I'll first start off discussing what is free diving. And uh, then I will move into uh, the gas law specifically. We'll look at uh, Boyle's law, Charles law, Dalton's law. And then also other related laws, which are also very significant, which is Archimedes' law and Henry's law. I'm just trying to uh, can't quite see my... Okay, there's my highlighter. But I just want to get the laser pointer on so I can direct you better through them. Right, so disclaimer, then what is free diving, the gas laws, related laws. And then I'll discuss application of those laws. I'll take you guys through a, a dive profile. And uh, I'll discuss the application, how these laws apply through a specific dive from the start all the way through to the finish. Uh, somebody's wanting to join here. Okay, sorry, I'll get that. Or you can just admit them. Yeah, I'm just struggling a bit with one screen here. 
All right, so uh, like I said, I just clicked into that was pinging away on my side, so I just clicked the join. That's right. All right, so then what I'll also discuss is the dive reflex. So um, explain what it is and how we use it. I'll show one or two videos of training that we do. It, um, this is where you shouldn't try and copy this uh, if you um, want to do some experiments because there's a specific way you have to do it to make sure it's safe. Uh, then, and then there's a dry um, mammalian dive reflex exercise that you can try. Um, all you need is a heart rate monitor of some sort or a pulse oximeter. I'll also discuss the factors that influence the mammalian dive reflex and how to develop that. Uh, yeah, I said I'll talk through the dive, the dive profiles and the various phases in a dive. These two go sort of hand in hand. I'll make some mention and show some pictures of this type of safety that is uh, required at free diving competitions. It's actually extremely difficult to run a competition in terms of all the hoops you have to jump through to, to tick all the safety boxes, uh, you, which you'll probably understand better by the time we're done. All right, then a, a few concluding remarks and just uh, rehash the disclaimer and then I'll throw in a few acknowledgements. All right, so let's kick off on, uh, on the disclaimer. So first of all, uh, the sport of free diving is safe if the divers follow the rules. So there's a bunch of rules and it's a long document. If you look at the various uh, bodies available, um, the document might be as much as 100 pages, just the rules to follow and a bit of justification for the rules. These are either for depth diving competitions or for even for a swimming pool event. Right, uh, so as I said, some of the activities can be dangerous, so please don't try them without getting uh, expert advice. And where do you get the expert advice? Expert advice, you can get hold of books. There's a couple of comprehensive books. There's a few online forums such as Deeper Blue. If you Google the term deeper blue, you'll find a lot on uh, uh, deeper blue forums. You'll find a lot of information, massive resource of information there. And then of course, there's also training courses, uh, which you can do with various, the various um, bodies which actually offer the training. Even in South Africa now, there's about five or six different groups of people offering. So th these would be people who are trained up as an instructor and they would take you through the course in a safe manner, learning all the basics to, to make sure that it's safe. Right, so there is information and, and content available for people wanting to study it further. Right, so just what is uh, what is free diving? Uh, got, there's four people sitting in a waiting room. I don't okay, know if you guys want to take care. Of that. Kind of, I don't know, it might right, be blocking your view. It's blocking some of my view, yeah? Yeah, I've got the one. All right, so free diving disciplines. So it's normally divided into ladies and, and gents. Those are, two, are, are separated. And uh, there are some, there's some talk later of bringing the older guys into a separate group. I already qualify having been over 50. So I, I make, make the masters, but I don't, the body I and compete under doesn't actually recognize young and old. Uh, it's just male and female. So um, yeah, it depends on, on the body that you're involved in. Right, so the depth in, in terms of depth, there's a couple of disciplines. There's one called free immersion. In this one, uh, you just pull yourself along the rope. You pull yourself down, you pull yourself back up. I'll show a picture just depicting each of these with a little description shortly. Then there's constant weight. That's where you put a big single flipper, both feet into one big flipper and you kick like a dolphin. Then there's constant weight bifins. There you have a, a separate flipper on each foot. And then there's the hardest of them is the constant weight no fins, C and F. And they use swimming basically, the most athletes will use vertical breaths, a breaststroke. Uh, it's very uh, difficult because you don't have the efficiency which you get from either the grip on the rope or from the flippers which are driving you. But this constant, is con as I mentioned constant weight. So all of these disciplines are done in constant weight where we dive and whatever weights you take down to the bottom with you, you need to bring them back up. So you can cheat and d deposit your weights on the bottom and then uh, you don't have to work to bring them back up. So then th that is a different discipline altogether which becomes variable weight. So I'm, I'm not talking about that today. But then in the swimming pool, there's also a couple of disciplines which are very, very similar. Three of them are the same. The DNF is dynamic no fins, which is the, so basically a horizontal breaststroke. So you're pulling with your arms and kicking with your feet. Then there's dynamic monofin. So that's swimming with a monofin on your feet, and uh, but you're just not really going deep. You're maybe at most two meters deep in the swimming pool. And then there's the bifin equivalent. And the one I skipped at the start is static. That's where you just take a mess of as much air as you can and you put your face in the water and see how long you can hold your breath. So the main focus of this talk today is, is predominantly going to be focusing on the depth disciplines. And there'll be some, some discussion on uh, the swimming pool horizontal ones when we look at uh, the Archimedes principle. Right, so getting into the picture descriptions of each of these. 
All right, so here we go. And the first one, so this is free immersion. So this chap is he's going vertically down a rope in lovely blue water, which we don't often get here in Port Elizabeth. So you, you can, you're allowed to grab the rope and pull. And if you notice, there's a lanyard, there's a, a clip or a, a um, carabiner which fastens onto the rope and it actually runs up and down. It can slide up and down and it's fastened onto a belt here under his wetsuit. So he's pulling himself down and then when he gets to the bottom, he'll have to actually grab a little tag at the bottom to prove he was there. And then uh, you bring the tag back up with you to the surface. So the reason for this connection between him and the rope is sometimes when we're doing these dives, we get very relaxed and a little bit too relaxed. And if you weren't connected to the rope, you might just carry on drifting off into the blue past your target depth. So uh, that's just there as a safety mechanism. And if something were to go wrong with a the diver, they are fastened onto the rope and there's normally a system to pull all the rope back up very rapidly and to get the diver back up to the surface uh, within at least one meter per second. All of those details described in the rules. Then if you notice some, on his neck here, there's a little weight. It's just a neck weight which clips around your neck. Um, sometimes people have weights on their belt or, or on the neck. But then that's, that's free immersion, FIM. So going on to the next one, in this case, uh, it's a photograph from below. This is the diver over here participating in the event. There's a lot of others around. These two are safety divers. This one is busy breathing oxygen to decompress after his dive. And, and then there's sometimes photographers and observers too. So you can see there's a boat. The rope hangs on a counter ballast system over here. So it's basically, this is the rope that people dive up and down. It also goes over the boat on pulleys. And on the other side, there's a, a big weight which is fastened here at the bottom which they will release if necessary, and that will then pull the diver up if there's any problem. Very seldom that it's actually used. I've never been in a competition where the counter ballast has been used. So it... Right, let me go to the next one. Fine, fine. Right, so let's go and look then at Boyle's Law. So Boyle's law, yeah, we're looking at the change of, of uh, pressure as, as a gas is, uh, is, sorry, the change in volume as a gas is increased, experiences increase in pressure. So it's basically the pressure of a gas varying inversely with its volume. And uh, so long as the temperature and the mass of the gas remain constant. So I kind of simplified it so that uh, school kids should be able to understand it too. So if we say it simply as we, uh, as the pressure of the gas is increased, then the volume drops. And as the pressure decreases, then the volume increases. So this is very applicable to us when we do a deep dives, because uh, let's say that I start off with five liters of air that I've breathed in at the surface, and then I go down, it will compress more and more and more. The pressure at the surface will be one atmosphere at 10 meters. It's uh, one atmosphere from the surface plus another one. And every 10 meters deeper, we add one atmosphere. So that on a, say a, a 50 meter dive, you would have six atmospheres of pressure on you. So that volume of gas would be, would be compressed uh, compressed a lot. So uh, I'll put my pointer on again. Right, so as the pressure increases, the volume is reduced. And then as the pressure decreases, uh, the volume increases. So when you, that's on your way down, right? So the volume reduces and your lungs compress. And then on the way back up, we have the reverse happening. So it's compressed and then expand. The formula that describes the law is a pressure times volume PV is equal to a constant. So the, the product of these two, the pressure and the volume, if you multiply them together, we will always have a constant result if we keep a constant volume or constant mass, sorry, a constant mass of gas or a constant number of moles of gas. So if we're doing calculations, we could then calculate at the surface. You could say your pressure is one atmosphere, the volume in your lungs is let's say five liters. And then to work out what the volume would be at depth, all we'd have to do is work out the pressure at that depth, which is normally add one atmosphere for every 10 meters. And uh, you could then solve for your, your final volume. And we find that these volumes become very, very small as we dive deeper and deeper. So for instance, I did a calculation the other day with my the mask, which I use, it's, it's a 60 milliliter mask or the goggles 60 milliliter volume. And by the time I get to an 80, on an 80 meter dive, that I would have blown eventually 480 milliliters of air from my lungs into a 60 milliliter volume mask. So you can see that gas, your, your air management becomes quite a challenge, especially for equalizing the pressures. So this one, I'd say Boyle's law is the boss, probably the most significant law, has a, has a very big impact on us. And on any other animals that dive as well, they would also have to have a lot of compression as they go deeper. 
and us humans are actually quite weak as divers relative to the diving mammals. For instance, the human deepest dive ever done on, on a breath hold was 249 meters by a chap called Herbert Nisch. And, uh, and a whale or a seal can easily exceed that depth by, by hundreds of meters. So Boyle's law is a, a very significant one relating our pressure and volume on the surface to pressure and volume at a, at a later depth deeper down in the water. So as you can see, thinking about this, the pressure in a swimming pool, let's say you're diving down to one meter in the swimming pool, the, the pressure change between there and the surface is very, very small, but not, not completely insignificant. Um, so, so there's not much of a pressure change. So this law is not really very, very strongly applicable in the swimming pools on the horizontal swims, but in the depth, it's very applicable. Right, so then another, another law which is uh, significant is Charles's law. I say yeah, it's a lesser pl player in free diving. Although it has a very significant effect, it, um, we don't have much temperature change in our bodies. So Charles's law is basically looking at a constant pressure. If we keep the pressure constant, the volume of gas is directly proportional to its Kelvin temperature. So in other words, if we take a balloon full of air and we heat that air up, not changing the amount of air on the inside and keeping the atmospheric pressure or the pressure in which it is essentially constant, that balloon is gonna expand as we heat it and it will shrink as we cool it. So that's an experiment I quite often do when I go and do chemistry engagement, I'll take a balloon full of, of air or we'll have the kids do it and then we we'll pour liquid nitrogen over the balloon and you'll see it will shrink from maybe three or four liters down to almost flat as in uh, maybe down to 20 milliliters when it's down to about the temperature of minus 200 or less. And then when we blow hot air on it, or we'll just let it stand in, in the room and gradually warms up, it goes back to the original size. So we could describe that as uh, in terms of uh, the volume and temperature. So V over T, our volume divided by temperature is equal to, to a constant. So that we always have the constant on this side. And if we vary either one of these, the other will alter so that we keep our, the, the ratio of these two at that constant value. So a more easy, easy form of which we can use if we want to compare before and after at one temperature and another temperature, the volume of the gas at temperature one, let's say it's our balloon five liters at temperature one, which is the, must be now the Kelvin temperature. So we have to add our, um, 273 degrees to it. So it would be 25 plus 273, the ratio of those would be equal to the volume at the second temperature, which is maybe liquid nitrogen's temperature minus 290 degrees or so, and then the volume will become very, very small in the process. So it's calculations can be done that on those around the gas laws. But as I mentioned earlier, as our body temperature doesn't change much, so, so the gas which you've breathed in or got um, in your environment will generally be close to body temperature or at worst, maybe water temperature, which is perhaps very seldom that we go under 10 degrees. So there's not much of a change there in, in the volume because of temperature, but a big change occurs because of Boyle's law and the, the actual pressure changes. So this one I say is a much lesser player, we fairly insignificant, but colder water dives do tend to be a lot more difficult than, than uh, warm water dives, more, mostly because of thermal management of the diver themselves. And uh, you also get a little bit stiffer and have to wear a thicker wetsuit for cold water if you are wearing wetsuits and it just makes it quite a bit more challenging. Right, uh, I'm not gonna go into this now, but you guys can go and later on look at the presentation. If you're gonna click on this little link, you'll find a video where they actually do that experiment, pouring liquid nitrogen onto, or, or dipping them into liquid nitrogen, balloons into nitrogen, and you watch them shrink, and then the chap blows on them and they expand back to the original volume. A big change seen over there. Right, so let's go and then look at uh, the next law, which is Archimedes' law. This one is actually very, very significant. Right, so basically what Archimedes' law is talking about is, uh, in the second one I describe it, so any body or any item or object which is completely or partially immersed in a fluid, right, so that could be a liquid or a gas, will experience an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid uh, which is displaced by that body. Right, so this is basically looking at flotation. So if, if I take a, a piece of uh, iron and throw it into water, it will be lightened by the fact that it's going into water, but uh, it will still, its net de density is still gonna be high enough so that it will sink and, and uh, drop down to the bottom of the water. But if I were to throw that same piece of iron into mercury, which is much denser, it will actually float in the mercury and it'll experience quite an upward force from the mercury that it displaces. 
So that's all about a body being immersed in water, which includes us divers, your body, which consists of yourself, the air you breathe in, which changes your density. Guys, so if you think about that, if you get into a swimming pool and take a big breath in, you will tend to float and you can lie on your back. But if you exhale all your air, you probably find you, well, you most likely will sink. So it depends on the density of, or the average density of the body, which is being immersed in the water. Another aspect to consider is that we also have a wetsuit and weight belts on us. So those all will contribute to your net density. And that will change as your body becomes pre-compressed by, if we think of Boyle's law, you become compressed, your, your lungs will compress as you go deeper and deeper. So your density actually changes as you go deeper and deeper. And you'll see that will feature when I describe the dive profile. Uh, just a little bit more on buoyancy, if you consider that yachts or ships can be made of steel or, or concrete. The first time I heard of a concrete yacht, I thought, how laughable is that? But uh, of course, it displaces a certain amount of air. Uh, water, there's, but there's air on the inside and it's not one big solid block of concrete. We could also look at things like battleships, the Bismarck, which had a complete displacement of 50,000 tons, or 50,300 tons, that's basically 50 million liters of water that it's displacing. And uh, in some places, the armor on that ship would be somewhere between 100 and 360 millimeters thick, especially on the turrets that house the guns or the line on the, on the edges where torpedoes might strike the ship on the side. So there's a lot of weight in a ship, but, but yet it still floats because it's displacing a lot of water and experiencing that upward force which keeps the ship afloat. And it will gradually sink deeper and deeper as we load it more. Uh, we lost a bit of time, so I'm not going to go into answering this question, but you guys could dig into that at a later stage. <clears throat> right, so Dalton's law is another important or significant one. And in this case, we look at the total pressure of a mixture of gases being equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So um, the total pressure of a gas depends on what different gases are there. And the larger amount of each of the gases there will contribute a larger portion to the pressure. So it's pretty much like you've got a scale and you're putting on a piece of iron, we're putting on a golf ball and you're putting on a, a drinking glass. They will all contribute to the weight. So similarly, a bunch of gases all sitting inside a vessel or a container, they all contribute to the pressure on the walls of that container. And it's just simply the total pressure is equal to the sum of the individual pressures. That would be if it was just one of the gases in a container and the others were absent, and we gradually put more and more gases in, the total pressure will increase and increase. Right, so this does have quite a significant effect on us. Uh, we're looking at... Um, the contribution of the various pressures. Nitrogen is the biggest component of air. It's about uh, uh, four-fifths of the air. Oxygen, about one-fifth. Helium is significant in, in divers who do technical diving where they've got a mixture of gases, but not really for us in free diving. But carbon dioxide is quite a player, a very significant player, um, because we'd often start off with a very rather small amount of carbon dioxide, and that amount of carbon dioxide grows as you do your dive, whereas we build up CO2 in your system because we're starting a dive on the surface with mostly, mostly air, which is our nitrogen oxygen mixture and only a little bit of CO2 is present. But by the time you come back up, you've got a lot of, a lot of carbon dioxide in your system and uh, it becomes an increasing pressure from carbon dioxide during a dive and oxygen pressure is gonna become reduced because we lose oxygen to your system because you're consuming it. And nitrogen pressure stays very much consistent. A little bit will dissolve into your, your bloodstream but generally, you will see its solubility is not very much in, in one of the later slides. Right, uh, so an interesting point about carbon dioxide, yeah, it is the gas that triggers the urge to breathe. So if you guys were to sit there, maybe you can do it while we add it now. You take a big breath and you hold your breath. After a while, you're going to say, oh, well, I feel like I need to breathe. And the main driving force for that is increasing levels of carbon dioxide in your system. A little experiment you can do to test this. You just go to the, at the bottom of the flight of stairs, take a breath, all right, or just take, take a breath and hold it before you go up the stairs and just hold your breath and see how long it takes you for the urge to breathe to kick in. So maybe it takes you 20 seconds or half a minute. Now go run up the stairs and then repeat the process at the top of the stairs. You probably find that you will have a very short tolerance because of the CO2 in your system. All right. Um, so, uh, okay, we'll just skip the, okay, perhaps I can mention this last one. So the total, you know, the high total pressure, if I'd say we were to do a dive to 50 meters, at 50 meters, I'd have an extra five atmospheres of pressure on me. 
and that increases the oxygen pressure by five times in my system. And that will then imp improve the probability of that oxygen dissolving into my blood and being carried by the hemoglobin. So this can actually make you feel extremely comfortable at depth. For instance, in a, in a deep dive, you'd start off, you'd have no urge to breathe. On your descent, normally there's no urge to breathe. And even down at the bottom at say 50 or 80 meters, there's absolutely no urge to breathe. The reason being is that there's a lot of oxygen being driven into your blood by the increased pressure, the increased partial pressure. So that's why this little law P total, the total pressure of the gases in your system, the nitrogen, the oxygen, and the carbon dioxide. So CO2 is quite small still, even all the way down to the bottom, but it builds up tremendously on your ascent. So you, you probably won't have any urge to breathe all the way to the bottom because of CO2 gas number three. Oxygen is being driven into your system strongly. So you, again, you feel very comfortable and maybe even slightly dizzy because of the high oxygen content in your system. And nitrogen staying pretty much the same with a little bit dissolving. So Dalton's law is very, very significant. Right, then Henry's law. So one, uh, one more over here. So this is now the solubility of a gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas in contact with the liquid. Right, so let's say so the liquid we'd be talking about would be the liquid coating on the inside of your lungs. And uh, the solubility will increase as we apply more and more pressure. So that's very applicable to, to some gases and less so to others. I've got a graph coming now soon to describe that. So uh, solubility of the gas is equal to K times P, right? Uh, or we can also see it as um, the solubility S divided by pressure is equal to a constant. So that's if we wanted to do calculations on this. So generally we won't do calculations um, as free divers, although perhaps technical divers might do some calculations along these lines and people wanting to draw up dive tables as to to what tables you would apply for scuba divers to apply um, decompression stops <clears throat> but say so if you were to do calculations along those lines you you take the solubility of the gas at uh, this initial pressure divided by that pressure and we would relate that to the solubility at a much greater or, or possibly even a lower pressure if we're looking at an, a pilot or an astronaut but in our case we're always looking at increased pressures as you go down deeper and deeper Right, so that's that little law which you can use to do calculations, just substituting in the solubilities and then uh, putting in the pressures as well. And we can solve for uh, the so S2 solubility at a, at a depth and at the surface, you would have had a certain solubility and a certain pressure, which would be one atmosphere at the surface. So pretty much you could use this to calculate the solubility at, at a deeper depth or a higher pressure. But lots of physical chemistry has been done on this. Right, so oxygen, nitrogen are the main gases, but CO2 plays a big role, as I mentioned earlier. And I'll move on to the next slide. <clears throat> right, so I've got two similar ones. Uh, the one on the right hand side is just to show you more easily understandable units. But basically, we're looking at the solubility on the y axis and we're looking at temperature on the x axis. Right, so if we look, look, consider the temperature, we're going to be sitting here a little bit under 40, the, the body temperature, whether you're diving in cold or warm water. The, pre pre the temperature is not going to change much. And uh, we're just looking at these. Um, these are the solubilities at one atmosphere. So they would increase a lot as we increase the pressure. But we can have an idea of here. Let's look at um, nitrogen is the blue line. This blue line creeping along the bottom. So we see nitrogen is very insoluble and it gradually becomes more and more soluble as temperature drops. So you see that, guys, we look at the tendency here. Gases generally become more and more soluble as the temperature decreases. So nitrogen, not much happening there. Oxygen is, is uh, becoming a bit more soluble as we go deeper. The solubilities are still re relatively small. We're only looking at oxygen solubilities. If we look at, uh, so I'm just going to move this window. <clears throat> oxygen solubilities we're looking at over here. O2 is the green line. So here's oxygen solubility and we're looking at maybe about 37 degrees. So we're looking at about Three, a little over three milligrams per 100 milliliters or 30 milligrams per liter. So it's oxygen solubility and the nitrogen we can see over here is the yellow line down the bottom. So oxygen is quite a bit more soluble than nitrogen. <coughs> but CO2 doesn't feature on this graph or on that plot, but we do see CO2 featuring over here and we're getting a very, very big, much higher solubility for carbon dioxide compared with the other gases. Right, and that's very significant. Um, the next slide will discuss, will just basically will depict the chemistry of CO2 as it dissolves into your system. Right, so 
on we go. Let me move this across. Right, so carbon dioxide chemistry as applicable to a diver here, we'd have uh, carbon dioxide in inside your lungs. Right, so this is this would be in the gas phase in your lungs. And then the liquid phase over here, this diagram was actually describing in water, but it's very applicable to our lungs too. So CO2 would dissolve from the gas phase in your lungs and it can transfer into a dissolved phase into the liquid in your lungs, right? And then it can react with water and form carbonic acid, right? H2CO3. And that can then dissociate in your blood to form hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate and, and acid. And we won't go this far in our blood. Generally, the carbonate concentrations will be super low because it's a very high pH. So carb bicarbonate is in connection with our carbonic acid and that and water react together. The water would be the water in your system and um, in equilibrium with the carbon dioxide gas in your lungs. So this would, would change back and forth depending on the pressure. So more pressure drives more carbon dioxide in, reacts with water, forms acid in your system, and then contributes to, to bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is quite a big featuring uh, carbon dioxide carrier in our systems. Right, so just as we go deeper, more CO2 dissolves into the system. Uh, when we come back shallower, the pressure drops and then we have CO2 driving back out of the system. Right, so then the next topic in, in the discussion, so that covers the gas laws I wanted to look at then is our um, mammalian dive reflex, this MDR, what is this all about? So yeah, we're looking at something called the blood shift. Uh, it was discovered in the mid 1900s where some research was done on, on diving animals and on people. And they found that as divers would go deeper and deeper, they could be animals or, or people, they would study them in a decompression chamber, apply a bigger, big, and bigger and bigger pressure while they're holding their breath. The lungs would compress, but what they found on using an ultrasonic sensor was that a lot of liquid would start arriving in the lungs. And what is basically happening is that the, uh, the small capillaries and uh, blood vessels inside the lungs that exchange the gases would actually expand because of the lower pressure on them. And there'd be a quite a big shift of blood from the, uh, from, um, the limbs and organs, right? So your arms and legs, uh, and there'd be a large shift of blood into the vital organs, the heart, lungs, and the brain. And these are the parts which you need to preserve. They're much more important than your leg. I mean, I can take off a leg uh, and you will still survive, but we can't take your heart out and your lungs and brain are the key components to keep the organism or the creature alive. So that's what the blood shift is all about or the mammalian dive reflex. So it's basically trying to, to get the vasoconstriction to occur. And we can actually feel it when you, when you do various exercises, you can actually feel the vasoconstriction um, during some of the exercises as the blood moves out of the limbs and into either selected muscles or into these organs, the heart, lungs, and the brain. But also what happens is red blood cells are driven out of the spleen. There's quite a large content of red blood cells which can carry oxygen sitting in your spleen. And as you apply repeated dives, these are actually released. Uh, research has been done on to actually prove that this occurs. And um, the other thing that actually happens is we experience bradycardia, slowing down of your heart. That might be 10 to 25% reduction in heart rate or even uh, uh, quite a lot more. Uh, I've actually listened to my heart rate on some dives and it will drop down sometimes to under 20 beats per minute. Um, you can hear it when you do it, uh, your lungs are quite empty. It's also been proven with uh, by putting heart rate monitors onto divers. Right, so where does this occur? And what other animals, seals, otters, rats, ducks, seabirds, and of course us humans. Right, then just moving on, why should we train the, the dive reflex? Well, it uh, increases the capability to do muscular work while you are functioning on a breath hold. So what will actually happen is you're, um, uh, so, so maybe you're doing things like spearfishing or you're doing breath hold photography or the retrieval of lost items, underwater repairs, and then possibly even assisting humans or sea animals in whatever activity that it is that you're doing. So we have an increased ability to do muscular work but what we should ideally do is train those muscles under those conditions. The dive relief reflex will also boost cold tolerance. Your legs and your arms will suffer, but your, your core of your body, the heart, brain, et cetera, will have more blood flowing to them and it protects them. And it will also control the gasp reflex. So if you jump into a pool of ice cold water and you often people lose their breath, with training, you can actually tolerate that, that you actually lose, you don't even have any form of a gasp reflex. I've trained my 11 year old son to do this. He can get into nine degree or into even colder water and not suffer at all. But it has taken a lot of training to get there. 
Right, so there's also some health benefits. You get improved art art artery and capillary flexibility, which just basically improves your vascular health. And uh, just drag this out the way. Uh, weight loss, loss can also be promoted. Uh, if you do this a lot, you lose a lot of weight. Um, uh, in my case, I've done it a lot too much, and then I lose too much weight and I get cold. So you need to just be careful on that. Right, so what brings on the, on the dive reflex, the mammalian dive reflex? Cold water on your skin, your eyes, nose, or nostrils. So if you dive without a mask, it's an even stronger effect. Cold water on your skin, your ear, or face. Uh, um, it can also even just be cold air that brings it on and will normally detect it by a drop in your heart rate. Some chemicals that in, induce cold, I've got a bottle of freeze gel, which I often make use of. If you rub it on your face, it'll, it's got the menthol or pigment. Probably not a good idea to try that too much because you might just find that you have to keep your eyes shut or you suffer because of the peppermint oil stressing your eyes. Other things that's tricky that might bring on a dive reflex is let's say people are in a motor car and it falls into water. The stress, the fear of drowning will switch on the dive reflex, which will tend to save the person or give them at least more time to survive than they would normally if it wasn't for the dive reflex. Right, to urge to breathe. If you suddenly experience an urge to breathe, you will find also the dive reflex will switch on. So diving under stress is actually quite quite a good thing. Um, if, if you're psychologically stressed and the urge to breathe is kicking in, it will actually enhance your um, systems that will save you, which is transferring the blood from your limbs to your heart, brain, and key organs. Right, uh, personally, I've also postulated that even just putting your feet into salt water can also induce the dive reflex. Um, I'd like to study that a bit more, um, possibly got something to do with the conductivity. Right, I see we've still got eight minutes left, so I think we can still manage to finish. Right, I wanted to show you guys a video of a friend doing um, dive reflex training. Um, so what do we have over here? Was we found a little river at Blanco, which is near Middleburg, sorry, Craddock. We had a super cold night and uh, we all took a turn to swim in the river. So let me play this video for you guys. I just need to take my cursor away, I think. Right, now I can play it. So have a, have a watch my friend training this. Right, so he's just composing himself there for what's about to come. Right, I'm the one doing the filming, yes? I'll show the video, the, the footage underwater soon. Right, so this is Bruce Mills, my dive buddy. Okay, now the dive reflex kicked in there and he was actually enjoying the dive initially, but now he's suffering the pain of the cold afterwards. The interesting thing is it only happens afterwards after the dive. So the dive reflex is actually protecting him while he's under that ice and uh, but then you do suffer a little bit afterwards, but with practice, it eventually fades away. All right. Um, okay, so that was that little video. I just wanted to see where, okay, right. So I'm just seeing that I'm still in the same place. Right, so pros and cons of it. It basically protects you, conserves oxygen, can help you to keep thinking clearly by, um, by uh, just bringing blood to your brain. You can uh, boost your anaerobic threshold, which is your ability to for your muscles to work under low oxygen levels. And it increases the chance of survival for maybe somebody fall, or an animal falling through ice into a swimming pool or into a river. Right, so uh, the, the cons are the disadvantages of the mammalian dive reflex. It makes you want to pee, so diuresis. Um, so if you take vitamins B and C, a lot, especially B6, you're gonna tend to want to pee a lot. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but it might be inconvenient. Right, um, sometimes you can have a bit of your, with the, the liquid moving into your lung space and competing with the air for space in your lungs, when you come back up in a dive, you might have some uh, overpressurization in the last meter or so. So that could be a little bit of a challenge there. Uh, it can also, uh, shock some people if they're not used to it they can become quite shocked by it so it would be better to train in gradually cooler water but not going directly into super cold water it does also tend to promote catabolic processes i said uh, consum consumption of fat and even mus muscle loss so you might have to do some 
some training, weight training, etc., to re replace what is being lost and consider eating more to replace the fat, which is going to insulate you. Right, uh, there's a little experiment you could try at home, basically splashing water in your face and tracking your heart rate. I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, I'm going to skip this one as well, um, because we lost a bit of time. Uh, there's just ways in which you can maximize it. It's quite self-explanatory if you were to read through those. I'm going to skip this video as well, also just because of a lack of time. But um, uh, right, yeah, we'll, we'll skip that one. I can maybe show it in the part two that we were considering for this presentation. All right, there's just a picture of myself. I've just come up after one of the record dives I did in Cyprus. I had to bring up a little tag from the bottom. There's the tag. So I've just ascended here from an 80, 81 meter, sorry, an 80 meter dive where I pulled along the rope. I've got the little tag to prove I was back and the judges issued a white card, which means I did all the necessary protocols and didn't cheat by grabbing um, or, or doing anything which is, was illegal, like dropping weights or et cetera. Right, so then the next thing we could do is look at interpreting a, a dive profile. And I think I'm gonna jump straight to the dive profile and just describe what is actually happening there. Right, so guys, and this is also one of the, the dives I did in Cyprus in 2019. I'm gonna just find my cursor now. Right, so basically at the start of the dive, the diver, or my, I would be lying on the surface. And uh, what I do on the surface is I relax and calm down. And for three minutes, I breathe very, very gently lying next to the rope. I'll then take a full breath and then I can actually gulp. There are ways you can actually gulp a bit extra air into your system by taking a mouthful of air and pumping it into your lung, lungs using your tongue. So instead of going down with my 5.5 liters, I can squeeze in another one and a half liters. So it's seven liters instead of that um, in initial five liters. It does make me much more buoyant. So there's quite a lot of flotation forcing me upwards. So I need a little bit extra weight and I have to work a bit harder on the initial part of the descent here. So getting down to 10 or 15 meters is harder than normal because of taking in that extra air. And then I have to continue swimming, spending some energy generating carbon dioxide. And by about 25 meters, I'd start sinking quite easily. And once I get to 30, I can stop kicking and then actually just relax. So from 30 meters, all the way down here, all the way down to 90 is just a free fall. So you're basically flying them through the water down, down along the rope. You can relax completely during that. And all you have to do is focus on equalizing. So moving air from your lungs or from your, your mouth into your mask, into your sinuses. But if you botch any one of those steps, so let's say I was at 70 meters, I accidentally swallowed some air and lost it into my stomach or back into my lungs. I can't get that air back up and my dive will finish either there or maybe five meters further and then I must go back up. So air management is absolutely critical. <clears throat> One little loss of air might, might uh, terminate the dive. Down at the bottom, I'm still feeling completely comfortable and rather euphoric. You just have to remember to grab the tag off the bottom. There's actually a camera at the bottom filming what you're doing at the bottom because you're only allowed to grab the rope once to pull to, when you're turning. And then you must let go of it. If you grab it more than that, you might get disqualified. If you look at the slope of these dives, it's a, a slope indicates the speed. So I'm going fairly fast over there and then slowing down for the free fall, enjoying the descent typically around one meter per second. On the initial part of the ascent, the slope is quite flat because I'm, I've got some weights on me. My wetsuit is compressed, my own body is compressed. So I'm having to work quite hard against um, the gravity to start going back up. And then after a while, I start swimming quite a bit harder and more intense. And then I go fairly fast over here and we're seeing a steeper slope and then start relaxing and changing my fin stroke. The reason for that is just to make it a bit easier on my legs. Uh, you, you, can, you can actually use your arms to pull in the water, but not pull on the rope. So we sometimes do that around 30 meters or so. If your legs are really feeling spent, you give a pull with your, your hands. The gases are starting to expand a lot now in my system again, the wetsuit is expanding. So often from about 20 meters, you can actually stop kicking altogether and just glide the rest of the way up to the surface. And then typically in the last meter or so, we would do a little exhale, blow out the last little bit of, start blowing out some air just to stop your lungs being overpressurized because of the dive reflex or the dive response bringing more blood into your lungs. So you need to blow out just perhaps in the last meter or even the last two meters and then inhale on the surface and uh, breathe a couple of times deep. 
that's a little description of what happens in the dive. That was a monofin dive to 90 meters, and it was just less than three minutes for the dive. Right, so I described all of those phases which are listed here in the presentation. I'm not going to go over all of these again because we're pretty much out of time now. Uh, just a little bit on the safety aspects, some things that we need to have here. Right, so there's a, the medic's boat. He has the counter ballast. So we, the divers could deploy a rope if somebody were to black out at depth or get entangled. They deploy the rope and the divers typically pulled up at one meter per second. If I look at the safety boat over here, it's quite a nice safety boat. The, the bow of the boat can actually flop open and the doctor sits over here with oxygen and all the necessary other equipment that they can pull you on there and give the necessary CPR, etc. I've never seen it actually being used, but uh, it's there just as a requirement for safety in case something goes wrong, that there's no problems with the athletes if, if there were to be a, an emergency. Right, just what it looks like. Oh, that was actually me coming down. There's my monofin on a descent, boat above. A nice, nice clear, clear water, much better than we have locally. Right, the full setup in a competition is typically uh, at least three boats, one for the athletes to sit on, the medic boat over here, and there's the competition boat. Right, equalization. I did mention the story of having to put um, as much as for my 60 milliliter mask. I just did the calculation, 60 milliliter mask to equalize it. It cost me 540 milliliters of air from my lungs, which is about 10% of my full breath. But what we do do is back on the way back up, you gradually learn to sniff that air in your mask. You sniff it back into your lungs, through your, draw it through your nose, and we don't lose it into the water. Otherwise, it would just form bubbles around your head. So I'll carefully sniff that air back in. It's actually a spearfishing trick to make sure that you keep it, keep quiet in the water. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the other aspects here because we're pretty much out of time. It's just an indication of a chap equalizing, having to pinch his nose to force air through into his eustachian tubes to stop damage to his eardrums. Right, a streamlined descent. That's one of the aspects we must consider is how streamlined is your descent. So this diver is going down nice and streamlined. You can see the hands held out ahead body shape held generally quite parallel to the rope and then only moving his, his hips and his monofin and his legs, keeping a very hydrodynamic profile. But so concluding re remarks then is uh, we can state that uh, the gas laws are very significant. Uh, not all of them apply, but pressure, buoyancy and the solubility of gases are very, very significant during a dive. The dive reflex, so that's the transfer of blood from your limbs to your, your, your chest, to the heart and the key organs and your brain, that can be trained and enhanced. And I'm sure if I try and do the same dives without using the dive reflex, I'd probably pass out or, or um, damage myself in the process. Cold pressure and empty lungs being key factors. But the one thing that's important is to be careful and always pr progress in incrementally. Like for instance, that uh, last dive I did, I showed you a picture of the profile was a 90 meter dive done two years ago. I'm hoping in about a month's time to go to Egypt and add another two or three meters to that. I won't try and jump straight to 100, it would be too much. Maybe it's achievable, but there's too much risk potential. Right, and then the disclaimer again, I'll just go through the same content that was in the disclaimer. Um, following the rules, keep it safe. We can learn a lot on it and always, uh, avoid hyperventilation oops i wrote here by hyperventilator meant to be hyperventilation breathing fast and deep we don't want to do that it might make you feel comfortable but it displaces carbon dioxide which is key to giving you the urge to breathe right this last a few acknowledgements uh, these people have all assisted in some way in my uh, ability to be able to do the dives and to learn and to be able to give the presentation but right, guys so that's it so we're only four minutes over so sorry about losing time during that uh, power change and thank you very much for listening great thank you so much dr rubich i'm sure there's going to be a couple of questions but i actually want to just kick off with one very basic one um you may you mentioned in your um dive profile that you dived that that dive was a duration i think of about two minutes 58 and then mentioned right in the beginning that one of the disciplines was the static dive where you basically lie in the water and hold your breath if i understood you correctly correct yes how long can can you just as a matter of interest hold your breath in a situation like that 
Yeah, so in that case, you're not you're not actually working. So you're not swimming down, you're not swimming up, and you can just focus totally on on relaxing. Um, so the longest I've done in a swimming pool was six minutes fifty four. Uh, the, the, the SA record is seven or eight, so I didn't manage to get it. I don't really train the static too much. Um, uh, I do a lot of empty lungs. So I'll, I'll often, even this morning, I do say about four or five breath holds where I actually blow out my air and I hold my lungs empty. And that, that does, there's a very nice training effect, but generally not going over three minutes there. But the longest I've done sitting still on sitting on a, on a chair was seven minutes 30. But in that case, I did actually do quite a bit of hyperventilation because there's not, not much of a risk if I had to black out in a chair. I didn't black out, by the way. Yeah. But the world, record, uh, the world record on that discipline is actually just under 12 minutes, and some guys have done over 12 minutes. So uh, just to give you a, a ballpark figure, I'm only sort of about halfway to, a little past halfway to the record there. Uh, but I focus much more on depth of disciplines because to try and train depth as well as static is, is just prohibitive. Okay, I think anybody who can hold their breath for seven minutes on is a little bit of a physiological uh, super bead, I think, personally. 